It's a car that uh, we built at my garage with the help of uh, General Motors and Alcoa Aluminum and Honeywell and BASF Paint. We wanted to build an all-American car. It's not a car for production. It's not something we're trying to sell. This is, as president of the More Money Than Brains Club, I, I just like to, to do interesting uh, automotive things. And what we wanted to do here was build a car that uh, runs on 100% biodiesel. It doesn't use any fossil fuels. The interior is what they call cruelty-free. No animals are used in it. The paint is environmentally sensitive. You know, it doesn't pollute the atmosphere. I, I thought, who are the best people to go to? I have a lot of friends at GM Design and Ed Welburn, the vice president of design. And I, I told him what I wanted to do. And uh, I'm not a car designer. I'm not an artist. I, I wanted to have two seats. Uh, four wheels and he said hey how about this and we would he would sketch something oh well, that sounds kind of cool and it, it sort of grew from that Alcoa aluminum which does of course the uh, chassis for the Corvettes they uh, hydroformed a special chassis for this car uh, it uses uh, Z06 Corvettes uh, front suspension and brakes uh, Z06 automatic transmission and the body is 100% uh, carbon fiber with the aluminum chassis Alcoa did the wheels too aren't they aren't they cool and a helicopter this engine could probably lift 15,000 pounds, 20,000 pounds, so you've got a terrific power to weight ratio. In fact, we can show the engine right here. That's a Honeywell LT101. It's about 650 horsepower, over 500 foot-pounds of torque. As you see, it's pretty compact, and it runs on just about anything that'll burn. Uh, you could use fossil fuel if you want, but as I said, we're using uh, biodiesel, and uh, that we can drive around without feeling guilty. Jay came to me with this idea about of this car and we're sitting over there in the kitchen and we kind of drew this up on the on the napkin the turbine really determined what the car will look like we needed a certain amount of space for the turbine it left us very little for the cockpit and, and the front end of the car so we wound up shoving the cockpit way forward in order not to make the car too long so we have a real short nose the driver's feet are just about the center of the front axle. It's a 650 horsepower rated turbine, pumps a huge amount of air through it. So we have air ducts over, over the roof going up to the front of the windshield. We also have air ducts on the side to let air in, into the engine compartment. The turbine runs about 48,000 RPMs. It has its own gearbox, which drives all the accessories. It reduces output shaft RPM to 6,000, which is perfect for an automatic transmission. So we're running that 6,000 RPM shaft into the transmission through a torque converter. Gives us four forward speeds and the reverse, of course. The way we have it set up now, we have two fuel tanks, one on each side, each holding 25 gallons of fuel. One side will run JP4, jet fuel, or Jet A. The other side will run biodiesel, a fuel made from soybean oil. The engine will be started on kerosene and then switched over to biodiesel once it's running. Okay, well here we are underneath the Echo Jet. As you can see, it's a real car, it's a real frame. It's not a modified frame from something else. Uh, it's based on the, uh, the Corvette, the C6 Corvette. Bernard, walk us around here. Well, we got the, the Corvette C5 trans automatic transmission here with the torque converter. The turbine engine sitting above the transmission, really. There's a transfer case in the front that brings the power out of the turbine and feeds it into the torque converter. Now this is a custom piece here. This is the piece we uh, made at the shop, and the Weissman is doing the gears for us here to do the step down. The reason we chose an automatic transmission is because with a, a jet engine, you can't really uh, use a, a standard shift transmission because because of the revs, you can't you can't disconnect yeah. the, the transmission from the engine because right. the engine would instantly over rev. Right. The uh, body is obviously all carbon fiber, done by metal crafters for us. The 6 Corvette brakes. We'll see how they last. There's no engine braking with a gen engine, but they should be fine. <laughs> they should be fine. It's a pretty light car. It's, it's lighter even than the Corvette. We're shooting for 2,400, 2,500 pounds. So right. depending on what kind of lunch I had, we'll see, how, uh, we'll see how that weight holds up. Now our metal man, Robin Officer, he does all this hand forming. Look at this is unbelievable. This looks factory. This is my favorite, the one big nut. Why have 12 little nuts when you have one big nut? Jim is doing the brake lines. You can see the carbon fiber there. The metal crafters did a nice job. Look how even the, the whole weave and everything is. See, here's what would normally be a transmission tunnel in a regular car. See, Jim has got the handbrake assembly in. I like these pieces here. See how nicely we cut this out on our water cutter. It's the way they did it on the McLaren F1. It looks strong but light at the same time. You can see the uh, roll bar the guys did. Look at that, pretty substantial. I should be able to crash this and walk away, no problem. Here's the powertrain right over here. See, this just mounts right up under the car for easy servicing. You just drop the whole motor down. 
Uh, this is our uh, LT-101, isn't it? LT-101, yeah. Westinghouse. Yeah, this is the hot section. This is the air intake. This is the gearbox with all the accessories on it. And, the, you know, fuel control regulator, starter generator, oil pump and filter. Here's the part we had to make here at the shop. This is the uh, step-down gear, transfer case, whatever you want to call it. Case, yeah. yeah. Uh, we did this on our CNC machine over there. It looks almost factory, doesn't it? did a nice job. That takes our power back here to our Corvette transmission. This is just a standard Corvette C5, uh, as are the A-arms and the suspension and the brakes. Here's our exhaust. The inside is a heat-resistant coating that's good for about 3,000 degrees, and the outside is just a... That will fit right under the glass area here. Now we're starting to put an interior in. That's what Jim is doing. Let's go over here and check that out. Okay, as you can see, the interior of the car, we're fabricating it out of aluminum. The sort of green tinted aluminum is half inch thick honeycomb panels. The original plan had been to make that all out of carbon fiber. That was gonna be too expensive, so we got the aluminum and we're forming each individual piece. A lot, a lot of time is going into all the piece work that it takes to put all this stuff together. We had to turn the brake master cylinders 90 degrees to get enough room in there for them to fit into the car. We got the boys here from Microsoft. They're doing our uh, dashboard, which is really kind of cool. What do we got here? We, we'll have two screens. Yep, that's right. So what we have here, Jay, is this is a full Windows Vista PC. So it's going to run GPS navigation. It's going to be connected to the internet, so you can right. stream videos and do different things. But okay. should I be streaming videos as I'm driving at, uh, at 200 miles an hour? That seems is sort of. How about audio? Audio, audio. Okay. Yeah. Assuming the jet engine doesn't overwhelm the sound of all of this. This is the seat for the Echo Jet. We got a fiberglass shell, uh, and we set the shell in the car, and we foamed the, the, the gaps between the car and the shell. So we wound up with a, with a foam surface like this. This has been sanded. The fiberglass will make a hard shell out of it, and we'll put some upholstery on top of that. This is Dan from uh, Stitch Corporation. These guys did a great job on the interior. And as you remember, since it's a biodiesel car, we're trying to be as environmentally friendly as we can. Uh, although this may look like leather, it is not. It's all artificial fabrics. Uh, no animals were injured or killed in the making of this vehicle. Dan, what is this material exactly? Alcantara. It is a synthetic suede. Now it's starting to look like a car. These guys did this in a matter of weeks. Look at all the stitching on the dashboard. And the seats are very comfortable. Those slots here are designed for when your seatbelt restraints, when you get the five-point seatbelts right. in. There's no graceful way to get in one of these things. Hopefully you'll have a date with a skirt. You've got your turn signals. You've got your various switches here to switch your gas tank to biofuel. Standard Corvette shift pattern, automatic transmission, of course. Uh, we still got to do the roll-up windows. We've got the sound system in. We got a way to go, but it's getting there. Let's explain to people how far we've gotten. I mean, we had it at, at, at SEMA, and um, obviously it looked good, but it wasn't running then. Uh, yeah, the first SEMA show didn't run, but it looked good. This last one, it actually was runnable, but we hadn't started it yet. Right. We're going through a, a standard Corvette transaxle, basically, hooked up it's, to a jet engine. It's like your Corvette's idling at 4,500 RPM. Right, exactly. And, and that, that's, that, that's... It's a little tough. Uh, as you can see, Jim just put the seat belts in. It's a racing harness type of setup. We have a quick release steering wheel in this to make it easier to get in and out of the car. So I'm going to take that out just so you have a good view of the instrument panel. Jim, tell us about the electronics. The, one of the problems was how do we get this jet engine to talk to the driver, in effect. Electronics International did the digital display. Much like the new uh, Nissan GTR, there's no actual gauge. It's an electronic display that mimics a, a, a gauge. Yeah, and they're, they're actually done as dials, so you're used to looking at a round dial. Your tack looks like a round dial. Yeah, you know how a veggie burger looks like a hamburger, but it's not? Same kind of thinking. In the center of the console is the Microsoft uh, computer display. Now when we fine-tune this car, what it really means in the modern car, the transmissions are actuated electronically, which means they have their own computer and 
you have to go in with this laptop and change settings inside the computer of the transmission and take it for another test drive and do this repeatedly until you have the car really drivable. The rest of the display just shows your standard speed, temperatures, RPMs, whether you have a fuel flow problem or anything like that. That's all out of aircraft, but we're tailoring it just to be used in this jet car. Unbeknownst to me the other day, Bernard actually snuck out and drove this car. So let's get his experiences. Bernard, how was it? Come on in here. Hey, you know, I'm See, I had to work. I had to go to work and they got to drive the car. How did it go? It was a little bit exciting actually, because yeah. a little bit scary, because the car is idling at 80%, right. which means it's making 200 horsepower driving down the road when you're on the brakes. Right, right. <laughs> so it, it doesn't really want to stop real well. But other than that, I mean, Jim had the transmission dialed in so it would shift and right. we're going down the road 70, 80 miles an hour now, like that. Now being a gen engine, we're looking at uh, about 750 horsepower. How many foot-pounds of torque are we making with this motor? Uh, close to 700 foot-pounds. 700 foot-pounds of torque, that's a lot of torque. See, unlike the jet bike, where you just have a two-speed transmission, this is a four-speed. We couldn't do the five-speed because it was a little too big. It was too but, long. Uh, the believe me, four long. speeds is more than enough. Yeah you're not gonna lose anything. Right now, we're just gonna fire it up and you get a chance to hear what it sounds like. As you see, this has taken about two and a half years, uh, but the guys do an amazing job. They do all the other projects while they're doing these as well. So Jim, let's let you do the honors. I'll get on the and other side, go ahead. I've got the headset. You know, you're the star. But I think I'll be all right. <laughs> we have the EchoJet starting procedure for Jay. Okay, step one, master switch, on. Step two, starter switch. Step three, 15% fuel on. Go on. Step four, the speed climb, that's rather gradually. Eight sixty at idle is our exhaust gas temperature, which is very good. You know, on the jet bike, we're looking at 1150, 1200 degrees, even more, as high as 1600 degrees. So uh, we've got it running fairly cool. As you can see, instead of uh, a rear view mirror, which is not possible to fit in this car because of the jet engine, we have these cameras mounted here. These actually work pretty good. Well, the last time you tuned in, if you saw it, we had the car running. Uh, well, kind of put our foot in a little bit. Uh, a lot of power going through it and it chewed up the spray clutch and the transmission. <laughs> yeah, so the nice thing about it is Jim and the guys have made this, uh, this sort of cradle here. You can just take the engine and now it comes out in seconds. Yeah. So we've got a brand new transmission in that box with, with beefier clutches. And uh, well, here, let's take a look. Ooh, ah, look, Christmas morning at Jay's house, everybody. <laughs> oh, there it goes. Jim on his wedding night. This is out of a Corvette uh, C5. C5, four speed. And it bolts up to the differential, which is how they get the rear transmission in a front engine car. Now, now that we got our 750 horse uh, Echo Jet jet car to go, we, we got to get it to stop. <laughs> and we had standard Corvette brakes on it. You're trying to hold back 200 horsepower. And like a gas car, you know, when the engine just stops and you, you, you're fighting rolling resistance, this, you're overcoming 200 horsepower. Well, these brakes didn't last too long. <laughs> so what do you do? You call the experts, of course, Brembo. Uh, and this is a carbon fiber. Look at this. This weighs about as much as a pizza tray. Yeah, this thing is, uh, it's 13 pounds lighter than that dip. 13 pounds lighter. And look at the size difference right here. Since we're not really brake experts, let's bring in someone who knows what we're talking about. Emmanuel, this is, you're the uh, engineering director for Brembo, right? Yes, I am. Come all the way from Italy. Yes. It's fun. Fantastic brakes. I mean, obviously, Brembo, the thank leader you. Thank you. Thank in this you. Yes. field. I, explain to us. Now, this carbon fiber, it, it just it never wears out, does it? Correct. Under normal, stri normal driving conditions, this is a brake that will last for the entire life of your car. Right. So with, with the carbon, uh, all you change is the pad. You never have to turn one of these, do you? Never. Uh, take us through uh, This is an caliper. aluminum uh, fixed uh, six pistons caliper. It pairs, it pairs with that rotor. It was uniquely designed for the ZR1 Corvettes. I have the SLR Mercedes next door that also has the carbon fiber brakes. Correct. And we took it to uh, Idiota Racetrack in Spain. And coming in at speeds of over 
206, 207 miles an hour, fire would literally be coming out of the caliper and the German would, yeah, that is fine, yeah, the fire is good, do not worry about the fire, do not be bothered by that. I'm going, the wheels are on fire, do not worry about the fire, they're supposed to do that. But it's, it's pretty amazing how hot. Correct. What kind of temperatures do you get on these? 1800. 1800 degrees. Yes. And they literally glow oh, red, don't yes. they? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's show them the application on our car. So we're using what is the front brakes all the way around the car. And I can't stress how easy it was to, to mount these because our suspension's based on that, which was on the Corvette, is a, just a bolt up. Took the parts, bolted them on. Only change I had to make is our wheels are different than a stock Corvette wheel. Right. So I had to make some changes to the wheels so that the wheels would fit on. Right. Now for what has to be the 10th or 11th time at least, Jim has taken the engine out of our Echo Jet car because that's what you have to do. Anytime there's a problem, you've pretty much got to take the whole thing out to examine it. We were driving on the road, it was running fine. We we're having a problem with low oil pressure. What is, you know, this engine is meant to run at 100% flat out all the time when it's in a helicopter. When you run it in a car, obviously you can't run it flat out. So we were at idle, you're going 60 miles an hour. So we're only getting, what? We're probably getting 65, 70%. This is the original oil pump. It looks virtually identical to this high capacity pump. The body of the pump right in here is much larger on the new pump. So they didn't make it any longer because it has to fit into a particular helicopter. Right. Or in our case, the jet car. So they made it wider so the gears and the impellers and everything in it are larger. It'll be twice the volume and hopefully our oil pressure will be perfect. I'll give you some idea how it goes. Uh, this is one of these works in progress. We're going to be doing continual updates on this car, but as it is right now, it's a running, driving car. We got a few little things. We're going to try and come up with a system to muffle that intake noise so it'll be dead quiet. That's going to be a bit of a challenge. But uh, stay tuned to this website, and uh, it's finally finished. We're driving it. See you next week.